if you could turn your Bibles to Romans 3, we're going to read Romans 3, 10 through 18. That the uh, emphasis is going to be on verse 13. Uh, we'll be reading this shortly. Uh, Pastor Mike actually referenced this passage last week. And just so you know, there was no collusion. I had that prepared even before. I'm like, well, he's uh, preaching my sermon for me. Uh, and if you want, you can also put a marker on Isaiah chapter 30, verses 8 through 11. Uh, I'm going to be referencing a lot of, uh, lot of scriptures today. So I would encourage you to write them down, since I won't have you turn to all of them for the sake of time. Uh, and today I just have one other exhortation for Messiah Bible Church. This week, if you would, please. Just take a few moments throughout the week and give thanks to God that we do have a local church where the uncompromised truth is proclaimed. If you don't realize what a tremendous blessing that is, then I please, please ask God to show you that because it is a blessing to be in a place. And uh, I'm just so thankful to be here. And I, I don't mean here preaching today. I'm just so thankful to be here where I, it, it's like a feast. And uh, the enemy doesn't like that. And we're going to be talking a lot about that today. So let's read Romans chapter 3, verses 10 through 18. Can everyone hear me okay? Is, okay. Yeah, thanks. Start in verse 10. As it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. <clears throat> no one understands, no one seeks for God. All have turned aside, together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asp is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. In their paths are ruin and misery. In the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. And I should have had you stand, but that's okay. It's a topical message, and like Pastor Mike always says, I'm going to be covering a lot of scriptures. But with that being said, I know that we reverence the word of God here. So let, let, let's pray. Father in heaven, I'm truly humbled to be here today. Father God, I pray this day that you would increase and that I would decrease, Lord. Father, I just pray that you would help us to take heed to the loving witness and warnings that you have given us in your loving word. And may you be glorified, dear God, for, you, for the sake of your dear son. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. The title for my message today, and everyone, uh, there's a handout. I, I would, uh, you know, suggest that you use it. I've been, God's helped me to discipline myself through the years just to write scriptures down and I can't say that I always have an opportunity to go back and reference everything, but it helps because there's times where you just want to remember something that, you know, the pastor brings forth or from a sermon, and it, it's very helpful. And it also helps you to stay focused on the message. It's, it's, I can just speak from my own personal experience. Uh, there's a discipline there. But the title today is uh, Look at What is Lying All Around Us. The emphasis is on the word lying. Uh, today, many don't know what to believe and who to believe. There's a lot of confusion out there. We're bombarded with terms like gaslighting, fake news, misinformation, disinformation. Hear, hear this, please. We, we live in a day when lying is not only accepted, but it's expected in many circles. I know that's something hard to grasp. It's not only accepted, but it's expected. And that's, that's a hard truth to take in. Uh, we as believers, we must encourage each other that it's God's word, the word that should point us to the God of the word. Okay? The word points us to the God of the Word, okay? It's not just the Word, it's the source of the Word who is the very God of the Word, 
And we must encourage each other in this, in this regard that this is the only safety net in these times of uncertainty. The only safety net. The Word pointing us to the God of the Word. A lot of people love the Word. But I ask the question, do they love the God of the Word? It's so important. Lying, deception, partial truths, diluted truths, compromised truths, and mixed truths are all around us. Sitting under uncompromised expository preaching will expose these lies because we're going through verse by verse. Nothing's getting bypassed. This is very important. Most churches do not use expository preaching for this reason. Maybe not intentionally, but they, they do not get to certain passages in the Scripture because they're able to bypass them because they're not going through the Bible word, word by word. Okay? And it's easy to miss, miss things, you know, I, I, in the Scriptures, like election and so forth. Myself, working in the finance field for the better part of the last 30 years, there's one thing that I've learned for sure. There, there's multiple ways to spin numbers to make them appear a certain way. Uh, in other words, the bottom line is not always the true or one and only bottom line. So if I didn't confuse you by saying that, that's, this is also most definitely true in the area of taxes, which may be more familiar to a lot of you. Many look for what are called tax loopholes. Some are legitimate. Some are borderline legitimate. Some not so much. So what is a loophole? A loophole is something that people use to circumvent the law that is vague on a matter or find a way around the law. It's easy to make something, well, it's not necessarily easy, but it, it is to make something seem legitimate even though it is masking the real truth. Bottom line, to reuse that financial term, you are not showing things in their purest form. My definition of a loophole, as I was thinking about this, it's a decorated lie. It looks nice, but it's really not. You're not really giving the truth in the matter. So many today are looking for loopholes in spiritual matters. But to the student of the word, God's truth is not vague. I didn't say it's not difficult at times as we study it, but it's not vague as we ask the Holy Spirit to open our eyes to the truth. But many try to make it appear that way to excuse sin, lies, and false teachings. It is often twisted, distorted, and taken out of context. I mean, how easy is it to take the Scriptures out of context? If you're not going, if you have no expo, ex, you know, expository preaching taking place, you know, it's easy to pull things out and look at this and that and, and not really see it in its, in its fullness or proper hermeneutics and so forth. So it needs to be studied and read properly. Sometimes it can actually, I think it can actually be dangerous for somebody just to read the Bible and just read it out of context. It can be their actual danger there. <coughs> it is said that just before the death of the actor W.C. Fields, who was an early to mid uh, 20th century actor, that a friend visited Fields' hospital room and was surprised to find him thumbing through the Bible. And when asked what he was doing with a Bible, Fields replied, I'm looking for loopholes. Through the ages and today, people try to find ways to make their lies align with scriptures. To elaborate a bit more on what I'm saying, they take scriptures out of context to appease their lying. So ask yourself the question, do you tremble at God's word or fear the God of the word or are you looking for loopholes in it? Are you looking for ways to make it fit your narrative or your subjective opinions on spiritual matters? 
I'm old enough to remember a time when you heard terms like someone being a man of his word. Remember this in the 60s. Remember, I actually remember people saying, or he's a God-fearing man. Well, a God-fearing man would be a man of his word. <laughs> and a God-fearing man would abhor lying. He would need to be saved, regenerated, to truly fear God and love truth. The only person who could really abhor lying is a, is a regenerated man because he loves the God of truth. He loves Jesus who is the way, the truth, and the life. And so he doesn't want to believe lies. The Word talks a lot about the fear of God and also talks a lot about lying and deception. This is what I want to talk to you about and look at with you today. You will see the areas we will be covering in the outline that was provided, as I mentioned earlier. So what we're going to talk about today has serious consequences if not heeded by a person in this lifetime. It needs to be heeded in this lifetime. Those of you who will be baptized later today are making a proclamation that you believe God's word and you believe God's truth in his son, Jesus Christ, and you do not accept or align with the lies of the world. You're making that proclamation today. I'm looking forward to witnessing your obedience to this biblical ordinance because it's truly a blessing. So the first point in the outline is we must establish that the sin of lying is a manifestation of totally depraved fallen mankind, we as the children of Adam. And as it says in verse 9, right before that passage, it says, all are under sin. Okay, both Jews and Greeks, we are all under sin. So lying is just a manifestation of this fallen nature. And we see in verse 13, which is where... The, the emphasis I wanted to bring out is it says that their throat is an open grave. The speech of the wicked is described as devouring, filthy, and dangerous. <clears throat> this metaphor also suggests that the speech of the wicked can lead to sudden destruction or death. It's very serious. It also says they use their tongues to deceive. It is the normal practice of fallen mankind to deceive others. Common grace may override this, but the fallen nature does not have an inclination to truthfulness. A natural man just doesn't have an inclination to truthfulness. So I think common grace may step in, but it's not the man himself if he's not regenerated. And it also says here, the venom of asp is under their lips. This phrase is used to describe the deadly nature of the words spoken by these men. Which can, which can quickly poison and kill. The lies of this fallen world are like poison. Sometimes the impact is immediate, but other times it's more gradual. The human race is under sin, which means all men are natural born liars. All men. We're inclined to be liars because it says right here that all are under sin. This is a description of fallen mankind. It's saying that all men are prone to lying. So now let's look at some of, of this love of lies in the Old Testament. Uh, I had you put a finger on if you did. If you didn't, that's okay. On uh, Isaiah chapter 30 verses 8 through 11 to provide a little context this is spoken to the people of Judah which includes Jerusalem a lot of the prophecies that I, and I are written to the southern kingdom the northern kingdom just kind of went off the rails in most cases but the southern kingdom there were still some hints of like wanting to like walk close to God and so a lot of the prophets, there are a few prophets that are speaking more directly to the northern kingdom, but most is spoken to the southern kingdom, which is Judah, which also includes Jerusalem. They were putting their, here in this particular passage, they were putting their reliance on Egypt instead of God. It's important to realize that God documents these rebellions for us. 
So we look at Isaiah 38 through 11. I'll read this, starting verse 8. And now go, write it before them on a tablet and inscribe it in a book that it may be for the time to come as a witness forever. For they are rebellious people, lying children, children unwilling to hear the instruction of the Lord, who say to the seers, do not see, and to the prophets, do not prophesy to us what is right. Speak to us smooth things. Prophesy illusions. Leave the way, turn aside from the path. Let us hear no more about the Holy One of Israel. So when we look at this and we see here in verse 8, it says they are a witness forever. God wants future people to take heed. Okay? He wants these, these, these things. 1 Corinthians 10 mentions multiple times how these things were written as examples for us. This is for people of all times to take heed. Verse 9 talks about how they are unwilling to be instructed or learn that unteachable spirit, which also is part of that fallen nature. Verse 10 says they do not want to hear the truth or what is right. They don't want to hear it. They want it smooth things spoken to them. This means things in accordance with their feelings, prejudices, and desires. They love their lies like an addiction. The fallen human race loves lies like an addiction. I want to hear the truth. Feed me the lies. Verse 11 says they did not want to hear about the Holy One of Israel. They wanted to avoid the true God completely. They would listen to a God of their own making, just not the true one. Oh, we'll listen to a God, but not the true God of Israel. So let's take a deeper dive into all this. First point, in verse 10, they wanted to be deceived or appease their natural hopes. See, they, th this didn't fit with their, 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 their plans, their goals. So they wanted to be deceived. Also in verse 10, it says this is what they wanted to hear, smooth things. They wanted to have their ears tickled. 2 Timothy 4.3 says, For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but have itching ears they will accumulate for themselves, teachers, to suit their own passions. Think about that. I was, I was, as I was studying this, I was like, it takes an effort to accumulate something. They not only, like, listen and want their ears tickled, they will accumulate to themselves teachers that will tell them and it will tickle their ears. It's like they're saying, I'm going to find people and hang with, even hang around with people that will tell me what I want to hear. So, if, you know what, children of God, if you, if you are truly serving God and you want God's truth to be proclaimed, don't, don't be surprised if they're repelled by you. <laughs> they don't want to hear the truth. It's this fallen nature in them. It's like, whoa, I don't want to hear that. Uh, and then also in verse 10, it says they, they intentionally want to be lied to. It's like, tell me sweet little lies, please. Tell me lies, tell me lies. So if you want to hang with the cool kids, if you want to hang with the cool kids, accept the lying, even promote it. Now, this is what so-and-so is saying. This is what this guy's saying. Oh, yeah, that might, I like that guy. He's cool, so I'll listen to him. It could be, you know, and also in verse 11, it, it, it's talking about believing in God is, is fine as long as it's not the one true God of the Bible. Like I mentioned, people use terms like, like the man upstairs or some higher power or a concoction of a subjective imagination. There, 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 there may be the attitude of get away with me with, with all that God stuff. I can't take it. I've had professing Christians tell me, like, too much. I can't only talk about that. I only have, like, like, seven minutes, and then that's it. I can't, you know, I can't talk about God anymore. I can't, I can't talk about these things anymore. I can't talk about spiritual matters any longer. In Romans 1.24, it talks about how God gives them up to their ways because in Romans 1.25, they exchange the truth of God for a lie. And they worship and serve the creature rather than the creator, who is blessed forever, amen. This exchange has damning and eternal consequences. And then also in Jeremiah 9, 1 through 6, and for the sake of time, I'm not going to re read the full thing. I'm just going to read verses 3 through 6. But just to put this in a little context, Jeremiah is known as the weeping prophet. 
you know, and I, and you know, it would cause it should cause us all of us to weep when when we look at what's lying all around us. When we when we should be mourning over our society, we should be mourning for those that are lost. I mean, they put Jeremiah in a pit. I mean, that's how much they thought about him. I mean, what are they going to do with us when we speak the truth? Oh, we just love you. Tell us the truth. Tell us the truth. You know, fallen man can't, isn't going to do that, okay? When God opens somebody's spiritual eyes to the truth, that's God working. It says, no man comes to the Father lest he be drawn. It's God's working that will allow us, for, allow them to be receptive to us. It's not us. It's God's working in them. So Jeremiah is mourning this moral and spiritual decay of Judah and Jerusalem. Once again, the southern kingdom. Many today are mourning the decay of our country and our culture. True believers should be mourning. This is also uh, here in Jeremiah. What Jeremiah was proclaiming was in total contrast to the many false prophets of his day. And I, like I said, I'll read verses 3 through 6. It says, They bend their tongue like a bow. Falsehood and not truth has grown strong in the land, for they proceed from evil to evil. And they do not know me, declares the Lord. Let everyone beware of his neighbor and put no trust in any brother. For every brother is a deceiver and every neighbor goes about as a slanderer. Everyone deceives his neighbor and no one speaks the truth. They have taught their tongues to speak lies. They weary themselves committing iniquity, heaping oppression upon oppression and deceit upon deceit. They refuse to know me declares the Lord. And even in Jeremiah 14, 14 through 15, it, it, you don't have to turn there, but it says the prophets are prophesying lies in my name. It talks about that. When we just look at this briefly here, Jeremiah, <coughs> it, talk, it talks here in uh, verse 3 that falsehood and not truth has grown strong in the land. They do not know the Lord. Does this sound familiar? Lying has become normal in the land. We shouldn't be taken aback by that. We shouldn't be taken aback by people that just, man, that, that's not right. They're, they're lying. They're, you know, everybody's lying. Why is everybody lying? Why are politicians lying? Why is this person lying? Why is this talking head lying? They're, they're not telling the truth. We should not be taken back by that. This, was, this is not something new. Everyone deceives his neighbor and no one speaks the truth. They have taught their tongues to speak lies. Think about it. I thought about this. This is like educated lying. They're actually teaching themselves to lie. They're educating themselves like, hey, how can I become a better liar? Here, let's have a seminary, you know, or, or a seminar on not a seminary. <laughs> <laughs> let's have a seminar show us how to lie I mean, you, you think about it I mean that's actually kind of like what they're saying here uh, they're, you know Romans uh, 122 says claiming or professing to be, to, to, to be wise they become fools they actually educate themselves to become fools according to God's word in God's opinion not necessarily mine, even though I agree with them. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to agree with God rather than them because I'm a believer in Christ and His Holy Spirit works through me and I have a desire to want to know the truth. And think about this, what I mentioned in Jeremiah 14, 14 and 15. God lets them know they're being lied to. God tells them you're being lied to. False prophets are prophesying lies in my name. Think of the brazenness in this, telling lies in God's name. Not only are you telling lies, but you're saying God told me to tell you these lies. I don't know. You know, none of us here are God. But there's a judgment day. And there's an accountability. If this doesn't cause us to mourn. It, it, it's very, we live in this so-called scary time of the year when everybody's got the things out there and so forth. But, like, this is truly scary when you really think about it. So here's the takeaway from all this before we move on to the next point. Man in his pride would rather continue to believe lies than admit he has been lied to often for a long time. 
Pride runs very deep and is the ruin of many that can't admit they are a sinner in need of a Savior. As I said, only God can draw them. Only God can bring them to this realization, like, you know, cry out to God. I need a Savior. But this is pride. Human pride works to keep people from admitting this. Pride and lying go hand in hand and are both manifestations of man's fallen nature which is the point I'm trying to make. It. This, these are manifestations of the fallen nature of man, that he, that he loves lying. In contrast, humility and truth go together. God has to humble us. And humility is also a gift from God, a gift of his grace. Rampant habitual lying is a result of a person in society that does not fear God. They don't fear God. We read that here in, in Romans 3. Uh, verse 18, there is no fear of God before their eyes. There's no fear of God. No fear of God. Why not lie? Why not live a habitual lifestyle of lying? All this lying and deception around us can make one's head spin if they're outside of God's word. We're going to talk about this more. We don't have to get all frantic about it. We don't have to be all taken back by it. And I we we almost should expect it because like i said they not only don't just accept lying they expect lying okay so we so we have to understand that uh, it's 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 so clear out there so moving on to the next point in the outline satan is the father and the source of lies and tries to push them on believers to hinder us John 8, 44, Jesus speaking to the unbelieving Jews said, You belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth. For there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. God is truth. Satan is the father of lies. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. He doesn't have truth. He is truth. And it's very important that we're clear on the fact that Satan is not equal to God. And he is not a threat or a rival to God. As some try to teach, you know, well, you got God over here and Satan, you know, and it's like, you know, some, no, it's not like that. He's not, Satan's not omniscient. He's not omnipotent. He can't do anything without God's permission. One reason we don't need to fear him. Because I know the attacks. I know that the enemy doesn't like truth proclaimed here at Messiah Bible Church. I know that. But you know what? God can protect us. We don't have to fear him. And I'll be talking. I'm jumping ahead a little bit. Uh, so looking at this a little bit deeper... God's word shows us how he destructively impacts unbeliever, being Satan. He, 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, this passage is very clear. It says, the God of this world has blinded the eyes of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. And then speaking to believers, believers are taught in, 1 Peter 5, 8, be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. This is talking to Christians here. He's speaking to believers. And see, he'll devour us with lies if we're not watchful. Okay? Not stealing or taking our true belief. He's not going to take away our salvation, but he will saturate us with lies. And that's one of my points in this message today. This is, a, this is a loving warning, not from me, but from the Word of God. You know, we, we want to talk about the promises of God, which we should. But God's Word is also full of warnings to us as well. And we need to heed those warnings as well. In the hymn, a mighty fortress is our God. In the very first stanza, stanza it says, For still our ancient foe does seek to work us woe. His craft and power great. And armed with cruel hate, on earth is not his equal. Luther is obviously speaking to believers in this hymn. He seeks to work us woe. 
He's armed with cruel hate. I know this isn't Bible, but these words are powerful. I forget the terminology you used this morning as far as it, it's like, it's, you know, that, you know, with the Reformation, this was like a, you know, a battle cry. And, and, and this is important that we see. So how does he work this woe in his crafty way, armed with cruel hate? Satan knows God's word, number one. He knows it well, and he'll mix it with truth and, his, and with his lies to make them seem authentic. He's the great counterfeiter. We need to be careful even with the word believe and make sure it is true believing. James 2.19 says, you believe that there is one God, you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. As Pastor Michael often mentions, mental assent will not save you. You must be born again. James, Jesus says in James 10, 10, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Those in Christ do not need to fear Satan and his lies, but be very aware of his schemes and realize that we can't battle these schemes on his own. And I think that's what Luther was saying to us here when he says on earth is not his equal. Like, if you try to battle them on your own, you're going to lose, okay? But as believers with the Holy Spirit in us, you know, I don't know about you, when I'm walking around the neighborhood and I see all these things looking down at me and trying to creep me out, I'm, I'm, I'm not scared of them, honestly. I say that honestly, you know. I, I've walked, I'll walk through, I'm not, I'm not afraid, I'm not trying to test God, but at the same time, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not afraid of these things. Because I know greater is he that's in me than he, than he that's in the world. Uh, so we don't need to fear these things. And, here, and, and listen to this here, folks. Satan's unobtainable goal is to separate the believer from God. I repeat, his unobtainable goal. Man, it's unobtainable. But he's still trying to do it. And, and if he can't separate us from a positional standpoint in Christ, he will try to separate us to hinder our effectiveness as believers in the kingdom of God. You know, I desire to work with you in the kingdom of God, but I could be hindered in that regard even as a believer. It would hinder my effectiveness of wanting to work with you. Do I have a desire to pray for you? Do I have a desire to see you walk closer to the Lord? These are important. See, this is the way he hinders us. This is the way he works us woe. And he's armed with it because he hates us. He hates us. But he knows he can't really touch us because we're God's children. Praise God. So now on to the next point. It's important to establish that believers do not need to fear lies and deception, but be very cognizant of them and be willing to face the battle. This kind of is just flowing together with the last point, but it's important. God has equipped his children to face all the battles we will face. Aren't you glad we, we serve a loving God who doesn't leave us defenseless? He doesn't leave us defenseless. And, it, and I'm going to mention, I'm jumping ahead, but it's not just let go and, and let God. He offers us equipment. He offers us spiritual armor. Why would he say these things if it's like, oh, well, God will take care of me. I don't need to be concerned about any of these things. It's important, folks. We're not talking about merit here. We're not talking about adding something to our salvation, to the position that we have in Christ, those, those who are truly regenerated. We're talking about the fact that this is a battle. And people in Luther's time understood that the spiritual life was a battle. Today, it's like, oh, you know, just add Jesus to your life. You know, you've you got a wonderful life. You just need Jesus, and everything will be just a little bit better. No. This is a battle. You come in, and there's a cost to this life in Christ. And if there was no cost for you, then I, believe, I say test yourself to see if you're in the faith. Because there is a true cost to serving Christ. There really is. It may cost you friends, family, all types of things. I, I don't say that, you know, with any glee. I, I say that because it's true. 
Has it cost you anything? As we just discussed, we do not need to fear the father of lies and his hordes of demons. 2 Timothy 1.7 says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. <clears throat> From the context of this verse, we can be confident that this would include that we are not to fear lies or liars, but be aware that they are lying all around us. When we are aware of the devil's lies, we will not be caught off guard or surprised by them. And I know I've been repeating that, but it's, it's important. In 2 Corinthians 2.11, God shows his children how to prepare for battle. It says, so that we would not be outwitted by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his design. Some translation, translations use devices, some use schemes. I even say it's strategies. He's strategizing against us. Okay, I can't get them positionally, but how can I impact their, their life to make them not as effective in God's kingdom? It's very important. So what should the strategy of the believer be? Stay in the Word. Stay awake. Stay alert. Only the Holy Spirit can give us this alert, prepared attitude. We need to have an alert and prepared attitude. Peter in his epistles repeats and emphasizes this attitude of prep preparedness to believers. He uses terms like be sober, be vigilant, watch and pray. He wasn't saying let go and let God. We're not to be passive soldiers of the cross, but active soldiers of the cross. Peter speaks with a tone of warning and desperation. Think about it. From the time that Jesus told him the kind of death he would face in John 21, 19, he lived the remainder of his life knowing that he was going to die a terrible death as he walked on the face of the earth. He knew that he, he Maybe he didn't know the time, he didn't know the hour. He knew that was coming. Imagine that. I don't know what, but I'm going to die a terrible death. Why? Because Jesus told him. Think about that. Do you think he had a carefree attitude about eternal matters? Do you think that life was a joke to him or he was okay with just wasting his time? Do you think he cared what the fallen world thought about him? The Lord, he walked with the Lord, and he wanted us to be prepared for all we would face. Through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he, he was looking out for us in his epistles. Not as the first pope, but as an apostle of God who truly loved Christ's church. Ephesians 6.11 says, he instructs us here to put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Here we go, those schemes of the devil, they're out there like in 2 Corinthians 2.11. Once again, you know, this is written to believers. This includes the shield of faith to extinguish the fiery darts of the evil one. And I was thinking about that just what I dealt with this week. It's not always these big attacks. It's sometimes it's just these little nagging attacks. It may not be the flaming spear. It might be the fiery, it's these fiery darts. He just continues to nag us, Okay. We're soldiers of the cross. That's why we, it's a battle. It's a daily battle. This is no, you know, tiptoe through the tulips, walk in the park, rainbows and sunshine all the time. This is a battle we're in. No, the Puritans weren't perfect. But when I hear criticism of them, people forget to understand. One thing that these people knew in that day and age, because I've read enough of their materials, they knew that the Christian life was a battle. And when you read your, their works, you will clearly see they understood that. Do, do professing Christians really understand today that the Christian life is a battle? Do they really understand that? <laughs> so this and this also, like I said, it, it includes these, this, this shield of faith, which is so important. Someday we will be the church triumphant, where we are no longer t tormented by the devil or sin. But now we are the church militant, and we must see ourselves as soldiers of the cross. When I was a young child, they used to sing onward Christian soldiers and things like that. I think like most churches, I think, I think some of them actually have taken that out of their hymn books. 
I don't even know. I haven't checked the theology. Maybe it's not all perfect. But, but at the same time, they don't want that type of thinking in the church. Onward, Christian soldiers. I don't know about you, but I wake up every day. I know God showed me it's a battle. <laughs> Be prepared. Point four. Believers are susceptible to falling to the same lies as the world. Well, I thought you just said we're saved. We don't deal with it. You know, it's different for them. As it, it is. They don't have the ability to battle them. That doesn't mean we're not confronted with the same lies that they are. That doesn't mean that, they, that we don't hear the same lies from politi we, politicians. We don't seem to hear the same garbage that's, that's spewed out on us every day that they do. The difference is we have the ability by knowing the God of the Word to be able to discern that we're being lied to. And not only that, we have the ability to overcome it because we have peace that passes understanding. We have joy unspeakable and full glory. We have, we have the ability to continue forward victorious in Christ, not in ourselves. And they don't have that ability. Think of, can you imagine, you, you that are in Christ, don't, maybe we don't all stop and realize, they don't have the ability to battle against these lies. All it leads to them is depression. And you're like, wow, I can't believe what's going on. This is, you know, why is the world falling apart around me? We as believers have the word of God that, that, that encourages us. So this message today, as sobering and, and as serious as it is, it's, I also want to encourage you in Christ. We have joy. We have peace. We can walk forward victorious not running from the battle we face the battle we don't we don't take a, a, a an arrogant attitude and say bring it on i don't want it it's like no lord keep as much of it away from me as possible but it's it's real we can't hide from that <clears throat> so after much thinking on this i decided to drill down on what i call and i came up with this name the lies of assumptions, because that's what they are. They're assumptions. Everybody assumes that these things are true, and they're not true. They're not in any specific order or priority, but what I would call a range of danger. It's a danger to them. I'm not sure how many uh, we'll get through due to time, but hopefully at least a few of them, since I, I see them as clear-cut examples of how Christians can be caught off guard by the lies of the world, orchestrated by the father of lies. I asked a pastor of mine some years ago the question, what is the true test for the American Christian? Because I thought to myself, like, we in America, we don't really face like what like the Christians around the world do. And uh, I asked this, like I said, in the context of not facing persecution and so forth. And his response was a little surprising to me, but it always stuck with me. He said, Ron, I believe the biggest test for the American Christian is, are we going to be seduced by our society? To ask it another way, are we going to be seduced by the lying world all around us? Are we going to let it drag us down? Are we going to fall for these lies? The lies we face seem to be subtle, but they really aren't. If we just look a little below the surface, and how do we do that? By testing them by God's word. The problem is that most professing believers aren't willing to do that and just play along with the world. Well, everybody's saying it. It must be true. So what are some of these lies in our contemporary world? Well, the first, and like I said, they're not in any specific order, but there's some I thought about. One big lie, follow your heart. Follow your heart. We hear this all the time, but it's a tremendous lie. Jeremiah 17, 9, which I know you're, most of you are familiar with. The heart is deceitful above all things and is desperately sick. Who can know it? We need a regenerated heart. And for God to remove the stony heart, a heart that is, to the song we sang this morning, washed in the blood of Jesus. To follow one's own heart is to walk in the broad way that leads to destruction. And I could preach an entire sermon on that. And the next lie goes hand in hand with the first one. What's the lie? That we can live lives, our lives our own way to please ourselves and we'll be okay. There is, Proverbs 14, 12 says, There's a way that seems right to a man, 
but its end is the way of death. John 14, 6 says, For we, and we all know this, that Jesus is the way, He is the way, the truth, and the life. Many actually think it's okay to live and even die doing it our way. Living a lie. It's okay. It's all good. Just walk through a cemetery sometime and read some of the epitaphs. I know you're probably not as morbid as I am. <laughs> but I've actually done this. And if you, if you read some of the epitaphs on the tombstones, it's, it's, it's striking. And, 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 I've, and, and I've seen some of these things, and it's, it scares me that these people went off into eternity. Like, okay, maybe they did. Maybe somebody put it there, and it wasn't actually that, what they wanted on their tombstone. I get that. But I don't know. I'd kind of, like, want to prepare. Like, don't put this on my tombstone, <laughs> you know. Don't put on there, like, Ron, sits, but Ron lays in the ground today because he's saved by his own good works. I don't want that on my tombstone. And I would make sure that that's clear, that I, I don't put that there. Uh, so I, I looked at one one time, and, it's, it, and I knew this guy. I, I used to I was, I'd do a little distance running. I, I knew this guy. He was a distance runner. And, and it says, it had a picture of him on the tombstone. It said, he was too good for this world. <laughs> if that's too difficult for you, just read some of the modern-day obituaries. You ever read obituaries? Mama, I know I'm really <laughs> morbid here. <laughs> it's like, wow, the, the newspapers here. Look, let's turn to the obituaries. Uh, <laughs> one said a guy that just died recently. A guy I grew up. He's a little older than me, but you know, kind of I kind of looked up to him. It said in his obituary he had a great sense of humor and he never took things too seriously. He went out living life the way he wanted to live it. Another friend said to me about another f uh, a friend of ours that passed away. He said, man, he went out living life the way he wanted to live it. This is a guy I played church softball with and all kind of things. You know, they, 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 were, they had church in them, but they didn't have Christ in them. One's eternal destiny is a serious matter, and many don't want to deal with this truth. Think of the secular holiday we're dealing that's upon us right now, and how people laugh at it, make and light and make light and mock death. I'm not going to try, try to, you know, rain on anybody's like parade, or what they think of this. This isn't my this isn't my purpose here. But I'm just saying, people do make light of and they do mock death. I mean, that part you can't you can't say isn't true. They make light of death. I know some will say to me, lighten up. It's just a little innocent fun. Dear folks, the death of unbelievers is not innocent fun. Death happens so often and many try to escape from its reality. And here's some sobering death statistics. I'm a, you know, like I said, I'm a numbers guy and I look at numbers. In the world, 170,000 people die per day. 170,000. That's the size of a per, pretty nice sized town. A lot bigger than a lot of our local towns. You, you, you'd probably have to multiply zillion opal. What would that be? I don't know, 5,000 people? You, you, you'd, ha you'd have to multiply that uh, at least like 15, 20 times. That's how many people die in the world every day. 7,000 people die per hour. 118 per minute. Two people die per second. Just think about it. About 7,000 people in this world will go off into eternity in the time I preach this message today. 7,000 people will die. Death is no laughing matter for anyone, and even more so for those outside of Christ. A believer needs to take seriously death, but he has peace and joy in knowing his eternal destiny, as I mentioned before. It's so important for one to contemplate the seriousness of eternity on this side of it. See, when people don't contemplate the seriousness of eternity on this side of it, then many times they laugh themselves into eternal darkness outside of Christ. They went out doing it their way. Many people even leave this world believe in some serious lies. They're even coddled in these lies by others. People coddle them in their lies. Oh, you're okay. I don't know. It doesn't seem right that I believe this way. Oh, you're okay. 
You're just thinking like everybody else is. <clears throat> Think of how dangerous this is. This big lie is not an innocent joke. Doing it our way. Living life for ourselves. We should have a fear for others whose eternal destinies are in peril. I don't know about you, but when I want to go out and I have a desire to witness to people, I try to think about this, that people's eternal destinies are in peril. I can't save them, okay? I'm only an instrument, but I'm praying that maybe God will allow me to plant some seeds of truth, maybe that someone else will come along and water those seeds, or maybe somebody else has planted seeds, and I'm going out, and I'm watering those seeds, and then God brings the increase. To drill down on this a little bit further, I'm going to look at it. I, I, I did a search on top funeral songs, <clears throat> and I checked with Pastor Mike before. I didn't want to break any, like, copyright laws or rules. <laughs> but the top 30 songs played at funerals, here we are, we're sitting in a funeral, and they're probably sure some of them have been played right in this building or maybe the one in Evans City. Number one song, My Way. Old blue eyes. I'm not here. This isn't to disparage the artists and the songs. It's how people respond to these songs. And they were actually willing to go out of their life saying, I took the blows. I'm going to heaven no matter what God says about it. Does anyone like sense like a lack of humility in that way of thinking? They, their total depend, dependence is on themselves and not God. And, and there's other songs. I mean, some of them are just brazen. They're not even really worth bringing, you know, like in this top 30, Highway to Hell. And, you know, I mean, being played at the funeral. Even when I was in the world and I grew up in a church, the brazenness of this song actually scared me. <laughs> it scared me. Even I had the old albums and some of those album, I'd see some of those album covers. You know, with all the demonic stuff on them, and it, I'm like, man, I don't want to, you know, you know, I, I want to have fun, but that's like going too far. Uh, and then the only one other song I just want to mention, you know, because it's like they, it's used in commercial jingles and all the time, and you know, and I'm not here to burst anybody's bubble because if you like the song, I'm not, I'm not here to like take that away from you. I'll let you. That's between you and God how you work that out. But <laughs> <laughs> spirit in the sky. It's a catchy tune, damning theology. I've never been a sinner. I've never sinned. I've got a friend in Jesus. Think about that. Number, in the top list of songs played at funerals. I mean, you can't, you're not going to be able to convince me that this isn't serious, that somebody's actually willing to go out of their life having these types of things taking place. I said, I'm not blaming the artist and the songs. They may never have met these, these people to like take attachment to them that way. But just because someone has an emotional attachment to a song, or this could apply to movies or books or anything, it doesn't mean it's truthful, let alone bring glory to God. Even sentimentality can be misleading and deceiving. My point is that many leave this life hanging on to lies just because they seem right, you know, well, my dad liked this song, or this was a song that was important to me in my childhood. Well, I guess that's all okay in a sense if that's, you know, you want to look at it from a sentimental standpoint, but, like, don't make it part of your theology. I mean, it, this is what people are doing. They're, they're going out of this world. All you have to do is listen to uh, a good portion of funeral messages today. And this is another lie, that death is automatic entrance into heaven for the majority of people. Of course, unless you're Hitler or a serial killer, then, you, you know, those are the only ones that aren't going to heaven. Don't worry when you spin the wheel of death. It's going to land on your number. You'll be fine. Some of these messages that preachers preach, you know, they, they, they popishly proclaim people into heaven when there's no evidence of true salvation. Is there any fear of God in these situations? Think of how confusing and deceptive this is to the hearers of these man-centered proclamations. Is there any concern for their eternal destinies? We should always 
be aware of the danger of offering unbelievers false hope. Always. Mike Jenner actually has a track about this, you know, about false hope. In place of the true gospel that is good news, they're offering this false, they're offering this false hope. We should be off, uh, this should be a warning to those who reject it. Wishful, and when I say reject, I'm talking about the true gospel. Wishful thinking will not save anyone, regardless of how much this is believed by many. And it's expedient that preachers preach a qualifying message and not preach with an assumption that all within the sound of their voice are truly in Christ. And that's why I mentioned today, be thankful that you're in a church where the truth is proclaimed. And pray for your pastor and leaders that God will protect them and give them the boldness and, and, and uh, courage that they need for their weekly proclamations because the enemy doesn't like that. True believers should rejoice when a qualifying, uncompromised gospel message is preached. Today, most people don't want to hear these kind of messages like when I was a kid. I'm not even saying the theology was correct, but I remember the old hellfire and brimstone messages that were historically preached. I remember sitting in a church, preachers preaching a hellfire and brimstone, and there was like a lightning storm outside, and the thunder clashes are coming down, and all this other thing. And I'm thinking like, man, what a contrast to a lot of messages that are preached today. Not the lightning and thunder. I mean, I guess that just happened. But I'm saying, you know, it was coming from the pulpit, and here I'm this like little kid. I was shaking in my shoes. So I'm not talking about personality here, but I'm talking about authoritative, authoritative messages based on God's word. We should be thankful for that. To drink, drill down a little bit more on this lie, uh, there's a popular thing in the deathbed. Conversions are automatic or commonplace. I, I, and I'm not here to step on anybody's toes, but I've known multiple people in my life who said they would turn to God on their deathbed. Think of the brazen presumption in this type of thinking. Jesus says in Matthew 12, 35 through 7, 37, the good person out of his good treasures brings forth good, and the evil person out of his evil treasures brings forth evil. I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give an account for every careless word they speak, for by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. Folks, a person's words in this life do matter. And if deathbed conversions were automatic, what motivation would there be to see people saved and live for Christ while they're still alive? What would be the purpose of the epistles that instruct us about the Christian life? According to the scripture, this whole way of thinking is nonsensical and very likely damning. 2 Corinthians 6.2 says, Behold, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. The regular talking point is you don't know what happened at the last minute, and this is true. Since none of us are God, I don't know. But are we to take this out of biblical and even historical context? If they're so common, why is there only one clear example of it in the Bible, the thief on the cross? With all that being said, we know Matthew 19, starting in verse 22, it says, Nothing is impossible with God. We know that God has the ability to save someone on his deathbed, but let's not take it out of context either. I'll leave these things between you and God, but I would say to you today, at the very least, caution should be taken to just make these assumptions. And also, another lie is that, that hell's not real or that only a select few go there. This is a case where lying can actually come in the form of denial. Without an understanding of God's attributes of holiness, justice, and wrath, it's possible to see how this makes sense to the fallen natural, nature and natural thinking. This makes sense, why people would think this way. To not believe in a literal hell is to call Jesus a liar, since he talks much more about it than he does about heaven. And I'll just mention a few of them, few of them here. Matthew 10, 28, and do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both body, both soul and body in hell. 
Mark 9, 43, and if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than with two hands to go to hell to the unquenchable fire. Matthew 25, 46, and these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Matthew 23, 33, you serpents, you brood of vipers, how are you to escape being sentenced to hell? And then we know the story of Lazarus and the rich man where the rich man lifted up his eyes in Hades. The doctrine of hell is rarely, if ever, taught in most churches today. The truth of God's wrath, fury, and judgment are hardly even mentioned. A common phrase is, God hates the sin but loves the sinner. This is often used, but it, if one's not careful, this can lead to thinking that the lost sinner outside of Christ will not face judgment and is not already under his wrath. Yet you see what, what I'm saying here. We have to be careful with that. Saying that God loves a sinner will not end well if he remains in his sins. And, I, and I'm close to closing here, everyone. So what should be the attitude of the believer when we look at what is lying all around us? And this leads to the final point. Believers should delight in the truth and seek righteousness which will counter the lies. Something often gets misconstrued about 1 Corinthians 13. And I've never really heard a preacher preach a message on it, quite honestly. We know that love is patient and kind and so forth. But verse 6 says that but love it does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with truth. You can't remove truth from love. Without truth, it's not true love. I mean, I see these signs when I'm walking around, love is love and all this other stuff, and I'm thinking like, no, it's not right, you know. If it's not truth, if it's not based on God's word, <clears throat> then it's not true love. Second Corinthians, or excuse me, Second Thessalonians 2.10, this passage talks about end times talks about those who are perishing because they refuse to love the truth and to be saved. So it's even saying there that if someone doesn't come to a place where they actually love the truth, they'll be they'll perish. They won't be saved. John 8 32, very well known passage, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Ephesians 6. And finally, we put on the whole armor of God like we're instructed to. So believers need to delight in the truth and seek righteousness which will counter the eye. So in closing, just a few, some questions to ask yourself. Do you love the truth of God's word? And I know many of you here truly do, and I'm thankful for that. But I think we should ask ourselves that question. Do we really love God's word? Do you know Jesus who is truth and the true Messiah? And just as important, does Jesus know you as one of his children who has come to the knowledge of his truth? Are you willing to tell others the hard truths, even if it might cost you something? Will you stand with those who are willing to speak and preach the truth? Are you aware of the lies that are infiltrating many local churches today. If we are not aware of them, how can we battle them? And finally, are you tired of what is lying all around us? Let's pray. Father God, I thank you that your word is true, Lord. I thank you for giving it to us, Lord God. Giving us the spiritual equipment that we need, Lord, to battle the lies that we face every day, to battle the sin that we face every day, Father. I pray that, Lord, through your word, that we would be encouraged as good soldiers of the cross, only good because we're in Christ. Only on his merit do we stand. This is only where our true hope and peace can take place, like the hymn that we sang today. 
that were washed in the blood of the Lamb. Father God, help us to care for our brothers and sisters in Christ, that we pray for them, that we realize, Lord, the same spiritual battles that we face, they're facing. Are we willing to work together and lock arms spiritually in the sense that we would pray for each other, Lord, that help us, Lord, as we face these battles? For though they are there, Lord, you teach us that they're there. But Lord, you have not left us defenseless and you have given us all the equipment that we need. And I'm so grateful, Father. I'm thankful for this church, this local church here specifically. I pray for your divine protection upon it as the battles of the enemy continue to come at us. These fiery darts continue to try to work at us to get us to compromise, to get us to try to maybe soften the message, dilute it. Yes, Lord, your word must always, your truth must always be spoken in love. But help us, Lord God, I pray all, to be able to define love by your word and not by our own subjective opinions of it. Help us, Lord God, to be aware that the world is not aware well, they may be aware of the lying, Lord, but they have no ability to battle against it. And I pray, Father, that in the coming days, Lord God, that you would awaken many, bringing, bring them to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Lord, if you, and if you so choose, allow us to be instruments to plant these seeds, to water these seeds. Give us a willingness and a desire, Lord, to share with them. Help us to see others in the light of eternity, Lord, because only this way, I believe, will only have a true burden to want to talk to them. Open these doors, Lord, if you see fit according to your will, and just help us to grow in grace and the knowledge of you as we walk this pilgrim pathway, as we walk this on this battlefield that we know is the earth and this battlefield that we face right now with all of the things around us the anxiety is like the it's just going crazy right now lord people are anxious even believers are anxious what's going to happen what's going to take place in the coming days help us to put our rest in you our trust in you father and for the children here today, I just pray that they would see the seriousness of the message today and look to the God. Don't believe everything that everybody is telling them. But Lord, help them, Lord God, to come to a saving faith at young ages, Lord, that they too would be soldiers of your cross. So thank you, Lord. Thank you for the privilege of serving you, a God such as you. And thank you for providing the solution for the human condition in your son, Jesus Christ. And then we stand this day, the solid rock. And I ask this all for your sake and for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.